good evening to everyone and welcome to tonight's Research Tuesday's First Ferment. My name is uh, Professor Shane Hearn and uh, I have the privilege of being the Dean of Indigenous Research and Education Strategy and the Head of Wurta Yalo, which is the Education and Cultural Centre at the University of Adelaide. To start the formal proceedings for tonight, I'd like to welcome Uncle Lewis Bowen to the stage to do the official Ghana Welcome to Country. Most of you would know Uncle Lewis, he's on our website, but also he and his family have contributed to the university in so many ways and we're very thankful to him, so welcome. Maru Changa, Gana Mian and Awamani, Mani Nipundi Gani Atana. My Biriko, Nankalankala, Tandanya, Mianaku. Nature Yung and Dalya, Nature Yakan and Dalya, Padna and Liwadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do as ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. There was a little girl drawing in the classroom. And the teacher went up to her and said, what are you drawing, dear? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she said, oh, we don't know what God looks like. She said, you're in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Lewis. Um, and I, I feel very honoured as a Noongar man to be able to work on Ghana land every day. So thank you very much, and um, I hadn't heard that joke before, so if you don't mind, I'll be using it. <laughs> I too would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide campuses, North Terrace, Waite, Farberton and Roseworthy are built. I acknowledge by respecting what is anchored in the past and what can be translated in the future. Thank you all for coming to tonight. Um, it seems like winter's set in. Uh, as I was walking across, I can feel the chill, so it's nice to be in a warm room. Um, uh, um, this, this research theme Tuesdays is uh, in conjunction with Reconciliation Week. Um, Reconciliation Week runs from the 27th of May until the 3rd of June. And as you all know, at the heart of uh, reconciliation is the relationship between the broad Australian community, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, and marks a time when all Australians can learn more about our various histories and cultures. And also, we should, during this period, acknowledge the thing that connects us, and that's our citizenship. But also, as part of the week, um, we will be launching officially launching these, well, the soft launch of the RAP. Um, and whilst this being a, an important date on the cultural calendar for us as Aboriginal people, it also is for University of Adelaide. The soft launch will take place in the hub and it will be an opportunity uh, for you, the university community, staff and students to contribute to the WRAP. We'll have a, a store set up in the hub where people will be able to come and answer a series of questions and contribute to the app, uh, to the to the WRAP. This is the first time um, that a university, that an organisation has undertaken this process, but it was my view that in order to have a, a reconciliation action plan that represents the university in an intrinsic and genuine way, what we needed to do was have that document touch all points of the university and give everyone an opportunity to contribute to that. So for staff and students in the audience, this will be your opportunity to contribute to that following that process. Uh, we will collate all the information and in a period of time then come back and ask for more information and then have a town hall style meeting to talk about the RAP, which will be uh, the university's first RAP and we will join 20 of the other universities, the 40 universities with RAPs as well. In, a, in, 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 uh, in line with that, to mark the week, we will be running a university-wide campaign inviting people to comment on what reconciliation means to them. Parts of this will include a digital display in the hub. These reconciliation quotes and pictures of their authors will appear on, hubs, on the hub screen throughout the reconciliation week. 
we see this as a way to bring reconciliation to the mainstream. And that's what uh, tonight is all about. Learning about fascinating and innovative ancient fermentation practices utilised by Indigenous Australians long before the arrival of European settlers. This, ev this evening's presentation will be delivered by Professor Vladimir Val 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 Jeremek, a professor of Enology and head of the Department of Food, Wine, Sciences at the University of Adelaide, and he is also directs the Australian Research Council Training Centre for Innovation, Wine and Production. Vladimir is a graduate of the University of Adelaide, having pursued studies linked to lifelong fascination with the diversity and elegance of nature. Through his PhD at the Australian Wine Research Institute, his work on fermentation, microbiology, led to a keen interest in the diversity of wine styles. Whilst his research has brought him to the natural home and adaptations of wine yeast to the environment and the environment as a source of new stains with interesting properties. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Vlad. Shane. Thank you, Uncle Lewis. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight. Um, and so thank you to the organisers for putting on this event. I should start with um, a cop-out, and that is that I am just a mere microbiologist. I'm not an anthropologist. There's a lot of expertise which is required for this project, which I lack, but which um, we have been able to make up through the uh, collaboration with a lot of participants. These are most of the people that are uh, involved in the project. I've remembered one sitting there that I've forgotten, Alice Bedridge, but I'll mention her later. Um, so my interest is, is primarily uh, uh, microbiology. Uh, my colleagues, Christian Varela and Anthony Borderman, uh, are based at the Australian Wine Research Institute, uh, and they're participating in some of the strain identification and characterization. Maggie Brady is actually an anthropologist from uh, ANU, uh, a social anthropologist, and uh, the fact that this project exists has a lot to do with her prior research of, of the literature. Philip Clark uh, has spent a lot of time at the SA Museum uh, and now is working as a consultant and is helping provide, again, a lot of information uh, about this topic, which I'll uh, cover during the talk. Joanna is one of my excellent postdocs. Uh, Kate and Gemma were uh, or are uh, research uh, assistants and, and students involved in the project. So it's quite a, uh, an interesting collaboration. So I'm a microbiologist. This is my bread and butter. We're interested in yeast fermentation. And so in particular, we're interested in how uh, yeast converts uh, glucose and fructose, which are the main sugars in grape juice and a lot of uh, plant material generally. They convert that through fermentation to ethanol, carbon dioxide, a bit more yeast, and there's some flavor transformations. Now, obviously, in the context of wine, these flavor transformations are quite important. So they can be the formation of new flavor compounds or the modification of precursors from the grape. Despite their importance, they're actually a fairly minor component. So you can see that wine is mainly water, there's some ethanol, and about 0.5% of the volatile flavor compounds. So they're, they're minor, but they're very important because they are the difference between grape juice and wine. A wine is not just grape juice with the sugar taken out and alcohol added. There's a lot of flavor transformations. So the main yeast that does this um, for us is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and it's the same yeast that is used in baking and brewing. So those processes, um, whoops, so depending on which process you're interested in determines which of those uh, end products you're, you're keen on. So if, you, if it's beer, then you're interested in the, the ethanol, obviously, the carbon dioxide for the bubbles and some of the flavor transformations. For most wine, it's just the alcohol and the flavors, unless you're talking about sparkling wine, where, of course, the CO2 is introduced from a secondary fermentation. In bioethanol, it's all about ethanol, maximizing ethanol production uh, and minimizing the others. Uh, and then in the case of baking, 
The interest is the CO2 to, to raise the bread. The flavour is also important, but certainly the ethanol uh, is driven off during the actual baking process. It's important to realise that not every yeast is actually the same. Um, so the strains that are used for those different processes are optimised and selected for those different processes because the requirements are quite different. This is a table showing uh, a number of uh, yeast selection charts for, uh, for wine yeasts. So most fermentations today are conducted using active dry preparations of wine yeast. So it's just like the stuff you buy in the supermarket. They come in 500 gram or kilo sachets like this. Um, and many of the companies have many, many strains. And you, as you just glance down through this list, you'll see that they mention different properties. So some yeast are rem uh, recommended for restarting stuck fermentations. Uh, others are good for particular varieties. Uh, some are more neutral, uh, produce clean, uh, aromatic white wines, etc. So different yeasts, and we're talking Saccharomyces here, can give you quite different outcomes. And that comes down to the genetic constitution of those strains. Different genetics, different metabolism, different outcomes. Now that's just in the world of Saccharomyces. It's important to realise that in a fermentation, uh, a wine fermentation, it's not a pure culture. So unlike a brewing process where you actually boil the wort at some point, you're effectively sterilising it and you virtually eliminate all the other yeasts. But in the case of a wine fermentation, you never or you rarely do that. So a wine fermentation is always a zoo of microbiology ready to potentially get out of control. And you can see here, this is an example of um, different genuses of yeast, um, so things like Decora, Picchia, Debaromyces, Mechnicovia, uh, Cleveromyces. I'm saying these not just to convince you that I can say the names, but because these will come up later on. So there's a lot of different yeasts. You can see the different colours corresponds to those different genuses. These are different samples of grapes or, or uh, initiated fermentations from around the world. The take home message here is there's enormous variability. There's lots of yeasts present and their proportions vary enormously and there's not necessarily any obvious trends. You do see a little bit of Saccharomyces, this blue one at the bottom here, but even that varies. What's important about Saccharomyces though is that it is the go-to yeast when it comes to fermentation. It has evolved to thrive in a fermentation environment. And you can see that in this data here. So these are again five different fermentations and they've been sampled on day zero, day one, day two, day three. So over the course of the initiation of fermentation. And along here we've got all the different uh, genera that were identified uh, and the numbers of those are shown uh, pictorially with these colours. So at the blue end of the spectrum, there's very low number or low abundance of the, of, uh, of the yeast in question. And as we go through yellow and then up to the rusty colour, there's a high abundance. And what you'll see is um, that different yeasts behave in different ways. So some of the yeasts, uh, or yeast like fungi, in fact, or obesidium, up here you can see starts at highish uh, numbers initially, but then drops off. Yeast like Hansenia spora, another one that we'll meet later, builds up initially into day one, but then it actually drops back down in, in most of those ferments. And importantly, you'll see Saccharomyces here is the superstar because it starts off at low-ish levels, but invariably it builds up to very high concentrations. And in fact, it is the yeast that tends or typically finishes the fermentation. And it does that because, as, as I mentioned, it's evolved to be much more ethanol tolerant. So it ferments, produces lots of ethanol, essentially poisons the environment, kills off all the other com competing, competing yeasts, and then it finishes the ferment itself. So Saccharomyces is, is very important. But, um, as I mentioned, even though you inoculate with Saccharomyces, you won't eliminate those other yeasts. Those other yeasts will be present and they will make a contribution, a sensory contribution. And so this diagram gives you an example of some of the uh, uh, volatile compounds, which many of many of which have a aroma or make an aroma contribution. So you can see things like isoamyl acetate. Uh, my labels have fallen off, so now I don't remember what they are. Isoamyl acetate has a banana type uh, character. Yeah, it's gone. Um, so I forget what all of these are. So the different aroma compounds, a lot of the fruity, estery type characters uh, that you associate uh, with wine and, and fruit products. 
the actual identif uh, identities are not important, but what you'll see is if you look at Saccharomyces over here, Hansenia spora, Candida, Saccharomycotes, Zygosaccharomyces, you'll see that the profile of those volatiles is quite different. So again, different yeast, different genetics, different metabolism, a different uh, compositional uh, contribution to the wine and therefore different sensory properties. So because of this, um, there is a resurging interest in finding new and interesting yeast. So recognizing that non-saccharomyces yeast don't necessarily finish the fermentation, but also recognizing that they, they can make an important sensory contribution. So try and get those yeasts involved, um, if possible, so as to, to, to make the wine more complex and more interesting. So the hunt is on or has been on for, for decades to look for new and interesting yeasts and of course the places where people look are places like the vineyard, uh, places like um, fermentations, particularly fermentations that, ha that haven't been inoculated with Saccharomyces, so there's less likelihood that all those so-called wild yeasts are being suppressed. But this has been going on for some decades and the tendency is to find the same old yeast. Um, and in fact, what's also been interesting from this work is you tend not to find Saccharomyces in the vineyard at all. Saccharomyces is actually quite rare, and Saccharomyces appears to actually only occur or arise once the fermentation starts. So the question is, where does the Saccharomyces come from? Where does it live? Um, some work done uh, by others has shown, and my things have jumped out, has shown that in fact, surprisingly, a lot of the Saccharomyces that you recover in Australia appear to be linked Saccharomyces that originated from Europe and the, the theory is that in fact they're being brought in in oak barrels that are shipped from France. So you age some wines in French oak, French oak obviously comes from France and there they're pre-contaminated pre if you like with yeasts from Europe. Um, of course the other uh, places that you can find yeasts if you look for them is uh, in the wild, strangely enough, they tend to be associated with the bark of trees, particularly oak, which doesn't seem a very hospitable environment, but, but there you go, they're found there. Um, yeasts are non-motile, meaning they can't move themselves, and so they're dependent on vectors, and things like insects and animals will actually move yeasts around, presumably from the trees to the fermentation or into the winery, um, and in fact some of these uh, organisms, particularly wasps, are actually thought to be uh, a site where the yeasts actually persist over winter when there's no fruit for them to grow on. Of course, we also have animal vectors, i.e. winemakers, um, who will also move yeasts around between wineries and so forth. So, we, have, we, we've, we as a group have had an interest in, in looking for, for other interesting yeast strains. Um, and I was sitting in a conference almost two years ago, minding my own business, listening to the boring wine yeast talks, when uh, Uncle Lewis's son, Michael O'Brien, actually gave a short presentation about the fact that Aboriginal people conducted fermentations. And this to me was an absolute bombshell. I'd never heard of this, I'd never thought about it. Um, and so I rushed to speak to Michael and ask him about it, and he was relaying a lot of the work that uh, uh, Maggie Brady had actually reported. Uh, and so we've since been in contact with Maggie uh, and with Michael and others. And it does in fact appear that there is plenty of evidence for the fact that Aboriginal people conducted fermentations. Um, and there's no reason why they wouldn't. Virtually every culture uh, in the world has some sort of fermentation history. So Maggie is actually a, uh, a social anthropologist. Uh, she did a lot of work looking at uh, alcohol abuse in Aboriginal cultures, and she was interested to understand um, what is the history of um, alcohol consumption amongst Aboriginal peoples. And from reading the literature, she observed, in fact, that there were plenty of early European records that describe what are effectively fermentation processes which produce alcoholic beverages. What was lacking and what was particularly exciting for us was the fact that none of the microbiology and none of the chemistry seemed to have been characterised. So this seemed like a real opportunity to actually learn something new. Um, the challenge was that a few of these practices appear to still be uh, occurring today uh, and we're not aware of any uh, many recreations of these processes. So. It was a surprise to me, and I guess I hadn't really thought about it, but I have had discussions with many people, and, and often the, um, 
uh, the argument that's made is oh, Aboriginal people didn't conduct fermentations because they, they had no vessels for water to contain liquids, which of course is absurd. You can't live in a country like Australia and not have a container for liquids. And what's become uh, perfectly clear over the course of this work is just how incredibly sophisticated uh, and uh, as a culture the Aboriginal people were uh, very in tune with their uh, uh, local environment with a very good understanding of uh, the world around them and how to actually uh, get the, the maximum benefit from that. So if you just go next door to the uh, uh, SA Museum, you'll see plenty of examples of containers. I'm sorry the animations have jumped around a little bit. So there's no question there's plenty of opportunity for, for um, containers to, to contain liquids uh, and therefore to conduct fermentations. Um, and in fact, there are even examples of where hollows um, by a water source were made and lined with things like kelp or paper bark to, to create a uh, a vessel, albeit not a portable one. So, vessel, uh, so, sorry, the vessels are not a problem. The only other thing you now need is sugars. You don't need to worry about the yeast because the yeast are everywhere. The insects and, and animals will actually bring the yeast in. So you just need an exposed sugar source for, for fermentation to occur. So in looking at the sorts of plant materials that we use for these fermentations, clearly, or, or, or logically, any material that, that is rich in sugars should be able to be used as a, as a fermentation substrate. Um, uh, my uh, uh, colleague, um, Philip Clark, um, has been uh, working on a related project with us and, and he's been finding some of these uh, old references, old uh, early European uh, records of uh, fermentation practices. So this is an example um, from um, uh, Norman Tyndale who worked at the SA Museum um, for about uh, almost 50 years in the early part of the 19th century, oh, sorry, 20th century. And he was a copious uh, writer of notes and this is an example of a footnote um, attached to uh, um, uh, notes from a visit to the Naracor area and he talks about um, the production of, a, of an intoxicant and the fact that um, uh, after after rains, um, so after showers of rain in early spring, uh, the rain diluted nectar in the, uh, was shaken off from flower cobs, which uh, I, I interpret or is interpreted to actually mean banksia cobs. So that was shaken off into a dish, allowed to ferment, and that would produce presumably an alcoholic beverage of, of some alcohol strength. It wouldn't necessarily be high. Um, and there's reports of a similar practice um, in WA using the local species there, which is um, banksia attenuata and that particular product was called uh, mangage. Here's another example a little bit later also from, from Tyndale talks about the fact that the, um, the yuccas uh, I don't know if you've ever seen these, uh, we would have seen these undoubtedly, but in the spring they were covered in these little flower structures. And you can see without even uh, sampling them that they are rich in sugars because they're covered in insects that are coming to feast on the nectar. And so just apparently just by running your hand up, up those you could actually uh, collect a lot of the liquid. Um, and again it, it could be steeped in, in water to extract the sugars. Uh, and you could replace the water, or rather replace the, the floral material on a regular basis to make it a more concentrated uh, sugary solution. Other examples that we've come across or that we've, we've uh, uh, discovered in the literature product called Kambuda which is made from uh, the pandanus nuts. So these were allowed to ripen, they were roasted and they were ground into a flour and then that was steeped in water and then that was allowed to, to ferment. Wyalina is actually the product that results from the fermentation of exudate from cytogums. Um, Quandong uh, was used, not, not actually the Quandong fruit that we're probably more familiar with, used, but apparently the roots were, were used, they were harvested, ground, steeped in water and allowed to ferment. Um, and tuba uh, is something which is not unique to Australia, it involves extracting um, uh, a sugary liquid from palms, allowing that to ferment and effectively producing palm wine. So there are lots of examples, there didn't seem to be, uh, to have been any work done on the composition of the starting material, on the yeasts, on the composition and the flavour profiles, profiles of the finished product, um, and, and whether in fact the fermentation process was, um, was beneficial from the point of view that it released uh, nutrients or made them more bioavailable. So we were very keen to, to try to get more of an understanding of these processes and then ultimately to feed this information back to the Aboriginal communities that we were working with and also to the broader public. 
So what I'd like to do is talk about some examples of some of the processes that we have started to look at. And um, so the first one of these is uh, uh, the, the end product being wire linen, which is produced from cytogums. And so cytogums are a tree, uh, eucalyptus, that's found in Tasmania. It was first reported um, um, by Hooker in 1844. Um, and you can see even in this first description of the species, there's already mention of the use of this tree as a basis for producing a, uh, a cool, refreshing liquid, uh, which was allowed to ferment, and it's called cider by the stock keepers. So here's an example of where the practice was actually uh, replicated by the Euro early European settlers, so they would copy what the Aboriginal people had been doing. Um, and it was so well known that, in fact, this is why the trees get their name. Uh, cider gums because they were able to produce a cider-like beverage from that. There didn't seem to be any uh, analysis of the composition of the, um, the sap or the finished product. The, the only thing that was available was actually part of this initial entry. And this is a sample that was about two years old by the time it was sent to London and analysed. And it contains, not surprisingly, alcohol, acetic acid, sugar. So it's clearly something that's gone through some sort of a fermentation process. So these gums are uh, localised in the central Tasmanian highlands, um, so uh, the area which is about a thousand metres above sea level, um, so it's right in the middle of, of Tasmania. Um, there's two subspecies proposed, um, Eucalyptus ganii, ganii and Divericata. Um, the latter are endangered, um, but they are found elsewhere. In fact, you can find, you can, you can go to Northern Europe and you can buy these as, um, as, as seedling stock or as seeds um, from nurseries. They're, they're sold widely there as, a, as an ornamental tree. But in Tasmania, unfortunately, they're endangered. Because they're endangered, we're not able to actively tap them to, to collect sap, so we're dependent on any, any natural flows. Um, they tend to be found in sites which are poorly drained, frost prone, um, and as a result, these trees must be somewhat cold tolerant, and, and it's tantalizing to suggest that part of that cold tolerance arises because of the fact they have such a sugar-rich um, uh, sap. So these are the sites that we visited, and we were very fortunate to have the collaboration of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre and allowed access to their uh, property, Trotha Nakaminya. Uh, we also visited two sites that were managed by the Tasmanian Land Conservancy, and they're marked here on the map. And this is a view of Trawford Makaminya, um, so it's quite an extensive property. Uh, it's a beautiful part of Tasmania, um, and we have certainly felt very lucky to be able to visit there. The sad thing is on the way here, you pass through Maina, which is one of the last major towns before you get to this site. And these are actually cider gums, um, which are dead. And I remember travelling through Tasmania many years ago as a child, and I would have um, travelled past these trees. So in, in the space of those few decades, these are, these, most of these are actually wiped out. Uh, it's suggested through climate change, but also overgrazing. Um, but in this site here, the trees look fairly healthy. Um, and so here's an aerial view of one of the sites that we visited, and you can see the path that we followed. And so this basically outlines the frost hollow, and these spots here correspond to where we found some cider gums. So there's actually not, not many of them. But what you'll see is that they live at the edge of the frost hollow. So here's a, a, a view at, at ground level. You can see this, this is very um, uh, mushy uh, land. Because of the, the frost that hammers this area in the winter, there's really not a lot of substantial vegetative growth. There's a lot of this, this, uh, these grasses. And it's only as you sort of move to the edges of the hollow where you, you start to rise out of the, the waterlogged area and presumably where the frost is starting to taper off or the effects of the frost are starting to taper off that you actually see cytogums. And in fact, this is an example of a, a fairly healthy cytogum here. The other way that you can pick them, well, there's two other ways you can pick them. They tend to have a blackened trunk because the, the sap leaks out and supports a lot of mold growth, but also as you approach them, you can actually smell the waft of, of vinegar and of fermentation. It's really quite striking. Um, here's a, a, another um, slightly more battered cytogum, and generally, actually, these, these trees are really copying it from all fronts. Um, you can see that they're this particular uh, specimen here is surrounded by branches which have presumably fallen off due to the effects of frost. And as the branches fall off, then there's a new shoot out off to the side, and this leads to that divericate branching appearance of the trees, which is where they get their name. 
Um, they're also very much favoured by animals, so the leaves are not terribly eucalyptus flavoured, so they're favoured by possums and the like. Um, animals scratch at the bark, insects bore into the wood. Again, they're getting hit by absolutely ev everything. But I guess because of their unique properties, they're the only tree that can grow you know, right on this site with fair, fairly limited competition. Uh, I mentioned that they're grown as an ornamental plant. You can see here these are some new shoots from, from a fairly old tree and they have this very nice um, sort of rounded glaucous uh, coloured appearance. So we, we didn't tap the trees, uh, we weren't permitted, we didn't need to either because there were plenty of examples of where there's sap just leaking from the tree, either from damage from an animals or in many cases insect borers um, boring into the, into, the, uh, into the wood and leaving behind them a trail of, of sawdust and, and leaking sap. And so where we could find, uh, where we could find it, we, we collected samples. We didn't actually find huge volumes, so I hasten to add. It was typically drops and it was typically uh, dribbles on the bark, but it was enough for, for uh, characterising the microbiology. Uh, we did also find evidence of where the trees appear to have, at least in the past, have been actively tapped in some way, which is quite interesting. And in an area where there's actually not typically a lot of rocks, it was also interesting to see a collection of rocks around the base of a tree here. This is, you can see the sawdust here, and this is where the, the sap is collecting down in this pool here. So this almost suggests like it's a deliberately arranged um, catchment area. In some, some cases, actually quite significant pools, you can actually see the liquid here at the base of the tree, and this is just from the natural leakage um, from these trees. So we've uh, run a couple of expeditions uh, to Tasmania. We've collected quite a few samples. Um, I think we have 129 samples from various uh, materials, so either the, the sap or the exudate itself, um, some of the sawdust from the, from the insect borers, um, swabs from the bark, samples from the soil, etc., etc. So quite a few samples. We brought that, those samples back to the lab in Adelaide, and there we first looked at the the liquid samples that we had, and we analysed those for their for their basic content. And not surprisingly, um, you can actually see that they contain quite high concentrations of sugars, glucose, and fructose. Um, some of them are very high. I suspect some of these very high concentrations. Just to put this into context, grape juice is around 220 grams per litre of sugars. So this is this is double that. So this is really very high. But I suspect some of these high concentrations are an artifact because some of these drops have probably been there for a while and, and have become um, desiccated. Interestingly, there's maltose there, which you tend not to see in fruits so much. Some acids and surprisingly or not surprisingly some ethanol already in some of these samples and the range was from zero up to six percent so six percent is like a pretty sturdy beer concentration so quite high concentrations in some of these samples um, an average of about one percent um, so we analyzed those samples we also looked at we extracted the dna from all of the samples um, and then we sequenced that dna using um, uh, its pcr methods uh, and then, once we get those fragments back, then we can compare them with other known sequences of known yeasts and find out at least what was there. The thing with recovering DNA is it just tells you what was there. You don't actually recover the organism necessarily, but it tells us what was there. And, and the beauty of that method is it gives you a fuller picture of the sorts of yeast that are present because not every yeast will grow on laboratory media in a petri dish. Some have very specific requirements. We don't know what they are. If they don't grow, you don't see them. Um, and part of a sample which wasn't DNA extracted, we then did streak that out using traditional micro, microbiological methods to try to recover some living yeast cells. And so from that, we got about 1,500 colonies. So here's an example of some of the data that we got from the, from the sequencing, the environmental sequencing, where we just extracted DNA to see what's there. So this is only about 30, 30 odd um, individual samples of sap or bark or what, whatever the case may be. And what you'll see is it's an absolute zoo. There's enormous variety. These are the yeasts, the known yeast uh, genera on the side here. So many, many of them. Uh, so it's fungi as well. So it's quite a complex mix. There's no obvious pattern. There are some yeasts which are reoccurring. So these blue ones appear, appear quite commonly. 
um, and I've lost some of my labels. There are some yeasts in here which are some of the familiar wine-related yeasts, so things like Hansenia spora, uh, Pichia, Cleavomyces, Torolospora, etc. So we do see examples of those as well. But there's also a lot that, are, that don't align with known fungal genomes. So we've got a sequence and it doesn't seem to match anything in, in, the, in the databases. And if I actually take away all the known ones, what's left here are the sequences or the proportions of sequences in individual samples that don't match to a known fungal genome. So, so you can see in some samples like this one, nearly 90% of the, the fragments that we get back um, don't match with anything. So what this suggests is that perhaps some of these are actually new species that haven't been reported before. So that tells us what was there. The isolation work um, allows us to work physically work with the yeast and characterise them um, and also identify them more precisely. And so we've started to work through those 1500 colonies uh, and, and identify them. We haven't identified all of them. Again, some of the sequencing hasn't worked. That could be a technical issue, but in some cases, it seems that um, the sequencing has worked, but there's still uh, unknown species. So again, it's possible that we've got new species or even new genera of yeast, which is very exciting, which is one of the reasons why we got into this work. But of those that we have identified, there's um, things which are perhaps not surprising. So things like uh, uh, Oreobacidium is, is a black mold that's associated with lots of plants. Uh, Candida uh, raleigensis um, is um, a Candida that's associated with rotting timber, but has also been isolated in some wines in Slovakia. Um, there's a lot of Hansenia spora, uh, particularly Osmophila and Valbiensis, and I'll talk more about those. This is the Osmophila, this is the Valbiensis from memory. Lachancia sidri, uh, as the name implies, is a yeast that was associated with cider uh, from France. Uh, and then some other common wine type yeasts, Mechnikovia, uh, Rhodotoro, which as the name suggests is a, is a pink colored yeast. So we've started to look at the properties of some of, some of the Hansenia spore or some of the yeasts generally. Um, we, we did check what these yeasts uh, have been or where these yeasts have been found in the past and what properties they have. So the Osmophila has previously been found in fresh must and dried grapes, which makes sense. Dried grapes would be more concentrated sugar, which sort of ties in with the sugar content of the, of the exudate that we've recovered. Uh, interestingly, this yeast can produce up to 9% ethanol, um, so it's, it's getting up there to a sort of a low alcohol wine concentration, certainly higher than beer. So what this tells us is that certainly this yeast alone could, would be able to produce an alcoholic beverage based on its ability to produce a significant amount of ethanol. Uh, Hansinus uh, spora valbiensis uh, is found in balsamic vinegar fermentations and cider fermentations. Produces some interesting ethyl uh, 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 esters. Ethyl acetate is vinegary, whereas uh, uh, phenyl ethyl acetate has a rose type aroma. Um, so we're looking at working through those many yeasts. The way that we're doing this is we're conducting small scale laboratory fermentations. So we use um, these 100 mil flasks, so we don't need to do large volumes, we don't need lots of, of end product, we just want to grow them in small volumes, enough to provide material for our analysis. So we do this using a, a robot which manages temperature, agitation, and automatically samples the flasks with, the, uh, with a sampling needle here. The flask, we've got a septum in the top. So this unit runs 96 fermentations simultaneously. You press go, and it will sample for the duration of fermentation. It's so successful that we've actually started to build a new robot, which is actually a 384 well system, so it allows us to do a lot more because we have a lot of samples to get through. Um, and what's interesting, some interesting factors I guess about some of these yeasts, some grow quite well at low temperatures, so even at five degrees Celsius, which is quite cold, they're still able to grow, which kind of ties in with where they are found. Certainly during the winter, it would be very, very cold there. So that fits in. Some are quite acidogenic, meaning they produce a lot of acid so much that they in fact discolour the growth medium. Normally it's this sort of um, beige colour with a lot of acid production. It goes to this quite dark brown. Um, and we also looked at some of the fermentation products that are produced in these small fermentations. And again, the details here are not necessarily important. Uh, what I want you to notice is that L256 is a commercial wine, Saccharomyces wine yeast strain. So this is the profile of what it makes in terms of lactic acid, glycerol, acidic, malic, etc. 
HU1 is a commercial Hansenia spore strain, so it's a non-saccharomyces yeast. You can see that's quite different to the saccharomyces. And then when you look at these other yeasts, the pattern is just all over the place. So they all have very, very different and potentially interesting properties. And you can see there's significant um, acid production in, in many of these, these yeasts. So potentially they would have some, some useful properties. In terms of fermentation, so this is a, just a high sugar medium. It's not meant to be wine or anything. Um, it's interesting to see how well they do. So this is a fermentation which starts with about 200 grams of sugar. And you'll see that our winey strain, L256, which is here as a reference, gets through the fermentation fairly reliably. It's a little bit slow, so it takes almost 20 days, but it gets, gets through. Our commercial Hansenia spore, which is supposed to be an efficient fermenter, actually struggles quite a bit and only gets about halfway and then just gets stuck, so it doesn't ferment any further. And it's quite staggering to see that many of our isolates actually are, are much better than the commercial non-saccharomyces strain. And in fact, some are right down here, sort of approaching the, the potential of the saccharomyces. So they're, they're really, some of them are really very robust, which is, which is amazing. So that's the work that we did in Tasmania. We started looking at other processes. We looked at the palm wine, or we, we sought to look at the palm wine process. Um, we went to Arab Island, which is in the Torres Strait. It's actually um, a stone throw, it's about 15, 20 kilometres from Papua New Guinea, which is just how remote it is. It takes an awful long time and a lot of money to get there. A lot of small planes, some of the islands are so small that they're really just long enough to fit a runway. Coming into landing is a very uh, exciting process, particularly when they sort of touch down and change their mind and take off again. Then we went to Arab um, because we were aware of an individual that had actually made um, palm wine in the past. Arab is unusual in that it's not just a, uh, an accumulation of sand, it's actually a volcanic island, so it's elevated above the ocean quite a bit. Beautiful part of the world, the island is surrounded by these fish traps, which were based on the idea that high tide, the fish get in there, low tide, if they don't get out, they're stuck. So we, um, oh, you can see that they're actually just your average you know, run-of-the-mill coconut palms. So we, uh, we spoke with uh, Uncle Henry who actually did this. Uh, his job was to actually make palm wine way back when. Um, and so he had quite a collection of favoured trees. He had the method beautifully worked out. out. He was very agile and able to climb these very tall trees uh, without any trouble. And so he told us about the process. We tried to recreate it. Uh, we didn't actually do all that well. The way that you do it is the, the inflorescence of the flower structure, when it starts to develop, is actually covered in a sheath. You can see one pointing here. And what they would do is actually chop the end off and put a bucket under it or some sort of a container. And then over time, the sap would actually start to, to flow, and, or the liquid, I should say, flow and collect in the bucket. Um, and then every morning and, after, and, uh, and evening, they would go up and change the, the buckets over. And they'd put a fresh slice just to create a, a, a clean cut uh, to keep the flow going. And during the course of basically that 12 hour time period, the material that was in the bucket would also simultaneously ferment. So we tried this over the time that we had, we couldn't quite get the flows high enough, um, but we did collect a, a quite a number of samples. You can see us here in our makeshift laboratory. Um, there being no facilities there at all meant that we had to bring everything with us in terms of sterile uh, containers and tubes, etc. Um, but nonetheless, we have been able to extract some yeast um, from from the um, from the palms. We didn't just focus on the palms. There are a lot of um, uh, fruits and, and flowers on the island, which we also looked at. And you can see here that uh, I don't know if you remember any of this, the species names from the previous slide, but many of these are actually different. So again, this ties in with this idea: if you go to a different site. A uh, different substrate that favours the growth of different sorts of yeasts. And again, some of these are associated with, uh, with wine um, or not. Um, uh, one of the candidas is associated with some, some spoilage. It uh, doesn't ferment terribly well, so I can't quite see these. Um, there's a number that are isolated from flowers. There are some which are thought to be associated with, with beetles and they form part of a symbiotic relationship where they help break down plant material which the, which the beetle then utilises uh, and some which are associated with, with human disease conditions. So again, quite a, a nice collection, in this case 71 isolates. Um, 
which we will characterise further. We haven't quite got the palm wine sorted out. Um, we did want to do it within a part of Australia, um, but I have heard that um, it's, it's practised very widely in other parts of Asia and other Pacific Islands. So I think we're going to have to bite the bullet and fly to the Solomon, Solomon Islands or something like that, and all for the, all for the sake of science. Um, I was also in, in WA, I was very keen to look at um, bank seers, um, particularly the attenuata. So again, we're, we're assuming to some extent that this is the bank seer that, that was used. There's another, uh, another species which may have been used, but these are very uh, prolific around the Bunbury area, which is where this practice uh, was said to occur. I hasten to add that they look, the trees look nothing like this. These look very convenient and you can just pluck them. They're not like that at all. The banksias are actually about 10, 15 metres high and all the flower cones are right at the top, so it's quite a struggle to actually get at them. But I did collect some of these um, and it's quite striking if you soak these in a little bit of water. They don't seem to actually have any obvious nectar on them. They, they seem quite dry. There's obviously nectar there because there's a lot of insects and a lot of uh, birds and animals attracted to them. And it's only when you actually soak them, so going back to that reference uh, from Tyndale, that you actually start to extract some of that sugar. And, and, the, and the cordial that you get from that is, is amazing. It has a really distinct kiwi fruit, banana type aroma. It's actually quite astringent, so it has that drying sensation as well. Um, so, uh, and, and, and a lot of sugar, and that was just from, from a few cones. So you can see that if you were to steep a number of cones repeatedly in the same volume of water, you'd get quite a high sugar concentration very easily. And there's plenty of other examples, um, and I haven't even started to talk about um, the possibility of fermented foods. Uh, that's certainly an area that's of interest to us, and it's an area that, that uh, is linked to another project that we're doing with the Arana Foundation, looking at foods uh, and, uh, uh, that were, and, and traditional processing methods for, for, for um, indigenous food ingredients. And I suspect there'll be examples of fermentation processes there that, that haven't, have gone unrecognised. So to summarise then, uh, we have been successful in getting quite a, a, a large number of potentially novel yeasts from Tasmania. We've gotten some information about the composition of the, uh, the cytogum sap. I'm very keen to make another trip or alternatively to go to uh, a location where we're able to tap the, the, the trees so that we can actually get the sap unfermented. Basically everything that we collect that is probably already started to go under some sort of fermentation or, or at least be contaminated by yeast or bacteria. We'd like to see the, un, the unmodified uh, material. Um, we are working through those isolates. There's a lot of yeasts that, we, that have been reported before, but that doesn't mean that they're actually not interesting. Remember, if you think back to the slide that I showed you about all the Saccharomyces cerevisiae wine strains, I mean, they're all Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but, and they're not necessarily the same. So even though we've identified previously reported yeast species, it's quite possible that the strains that we're actually dealing with have very distinct and interesting properties. Um, and there's certainly some candidates for, for entirely new uh, species or, or genera, so we're very excited about characterising those. We are working fairly closely with, with the Aboriginal communities and, and relaying the information as we get it. Um, and as I said, I need to go to, to Solomon Islands. Um, but there's certainly more field trips and more substrates that we plan to look at. And so I'll finish there um, uh, with some acknowledgements. So uh, thanks to Uncle Lewis and, and Michael O'Brien who really helped kick this work off. Um, the University of Adelaide has been very generous in providing seed funding for a project that had no funding, just a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. So that money originally came from uh, the Dean and the DVCR. Uh, one of my Previous honours students who worked on this was funded by Playford uh, Cooper's scholarship. Wine Australia support most of the wine related research that we do, so that perform, provides a platform for us to, to do some of this other interesting work. Of course, my colleagues at the Australian Wine Research Institute, the UT Foundation have also been able to give us a small amount of money to expand the project. The, the bodies that manage the, the land that we visited and were kind enough to give us access. Uh, Maggie at ANU has been very helpful in terms of providing some of the background literature uh, and access to some of the um, early European records that talk about some of these processes. Dan Jarrell is a, uh, a mycologist from the University of British Columbia who contributed to some of the expeditions and, and Philip Clark has been very helpful and continues to be helpful in 
in sending us information as he finds it, as he works through um, looking for information about uh, Aboriginal use of, of plant material as, as, as a food rather than a, as, as, rather than a beverage. And I'll finish with my usual uh, plea for students. Uh, we're very happy to see honours, masters, PhD students. Um, so any support we can get to, to move this project would, would be uh, very gratefully received. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. An interesting piece of work and um, a nice mix of indigenous science and traditional science is working together. Um, thank you very much for that, for sharing your, your research. Um, now's the time for the audience to get involved. Sorry. Now's the time to open up for questions, so I'd invite the audience to uh, direct their questions to Vlad. There's one up there. There's some roving microphones, so rather than me throw this one up there, I'll ask someone to pass you one. Just in the middle here. Yeah. Gentleman with the blue top on. Maybe I have to. Thanks, Kate. Uh, two questions. One, have you actually made any wine out of any of this? Uh, we haven't as yet. We've um, we've really just been characterising the yeasts under, I guess, wine-like conditions. Uh, we don't necessarily expect that we'll find yeasts uh, which could be useful in wine making as part of this process. Um, we may. Uh, the interest really is to characterise these processes as we believe they were practised. If it generates interest and there may be a desire for someone to to reproduce some of these processes or something like that, that's that would be wonderful. I can tell you now, you can't do it from cider gums because there's just not, not enough supply. And the other one, uh, who would own the uh, strains? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would suspect that it's something that we would uh, probably share um, with the uh, with the landowners. Uh, it's really up to them what they want to do with it. So they'd get first right of refusal, I guess. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions here in the front? Thank you. I'm wondering if there's any evidence of uh, similar practices from South Australia or particularly the Northern Territory where I've uh, sampled the sugary um, nectar from Grevillea. So I've, I have to defer to my learned colleagues, Uncle Lewis and Michael O'Brien, so they certainly have advised me that the, the quondam root process is something that was practiced here. The banks here were used here. And I'm sure there are plenty of uh, other sugar-rich floral materials that were used. So it's just a matter of, of uncovering that. So we're working through that. Did you want to add to that, Uncle Lewis? No. no. OK. I thought I'd ask. One more question up here. Thanks for such a great presentation. I'm just wondering, you mentioned very briefly that this could be applied or there's other applications in the food industry and I'm wondering what you're looking at in terms of um, foods rather than just wine. So the, the food area is something that we're really just starting to consider now. As, as I mentioned, it's part of a larger project that, that's being funded by the Arana Foundation. And for those that aren't aware, the Arana Foundation is, is a foundation that was set up by Jacques Zonfrilo from the Irana uh, restaurant and his interest is to understand these practices from a, uh, I guess, a traditional point of view, but also to look at whether there's opportunities to provide a contemporary spin on some of those and ideally, uh, whatever the end product, create a demand uh, for the end product so that there's an opportunity for then the Aboriginal communities uh, to, to gain employment by supplying the raw materials or in fact providing the fermented food. So, so we are starting to look at that. We're a long way off from actually um, doing much there. We've, we've started to isolate some yeast from some of the materials that Jock himself has brought in and uses in the restaurant. 
Um, but what we really need to do is, is to go back out to the communities uh, and see how they uh, manipulate these materials. And as I said, I'm sure that there will be evidence of fermentations. Any point where a plant material which contains sugars is held over or stored in some way, there's going to be a fermentation of some sort, undoubtedly. We have a question over here. Oh, thanks for the presentation. I'm interested in some of the other uh, sugar-rich sources like honey ant and, of course, bees. I mean, there's huge amounts of sugars there. Um, and uh, their role in maybe not drink so much, but uh, like the other question, food, food preservation. I know of, uh, you know, dried berries and so on uh, being over wintering food sources, you know, so food preserving is sort of one of the big areas where I, where I think about fermenting. Um, how's the research going there? We, we haven't started. There, there are clearly a long list of things that we could look at. We haven't started at looking uh, beyond the, the few that I've discussed, but there, there's possibilities, particularly if we can expand the project. I would, I would suspect that desiccation would probably be a more important way of preserving uh, the material, but, but even that in the early stages may include some element of fermentation and be interesting to see whether that has an impact on then the nutritional composition or the bioavailability of nutrients or in fact the flavour profile. A lot of the reasons that fermentation is, is favoured in I guess European cultures is because it changes the flavour profile in a positive way. It would be fascinating to see what this does uh, to some of these, these food materials. Um, thank you for an interesting talk. In my lifetime, I've seen palm wine produced in West Africa and Nigeria over quite a number of years, and also last year in Cambodia. In both cases, they actually went the next step and distilled the palm wine into local gins, it's normally called. Is there any evidence that that ever happened here? Certainly that appears to be the case in the Torres Strait, or that, so distillation was practiced, so that seems to be practices that were introduced from, from Asia about 300 years ago. But we're, we're drawing the line at distillation, we're not interested in dis distilled products, just those that result from the initial fermentation. But, but there's undoubtedly evidence here that, that that was done. Thank you. And one other question, which is slightly different if I know. Um, one of your slides, you mentioned terpenes. Well, I'm aware of a company in Israel, in fact, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, which can manufacture terpenes and can replicate natural terpenes to about 99 plus percent accuracy. Has that ever been thought of in wine production? Producing terpenes? Producing terpenes to add to wine, which may be less than perfect? Uh, the short answer would be no. Uh, generally, it's not per permissible to add flavourants to wine unless you then call it a wine product. So wine is meant to be the natural result of the fermentation of, of grapes, grape juice. So the flavours that you get in wine should occur naturally from either the grapes or the yeast or their interaction. So you, you don't add flavourants unless you then call it a a, a wine product where it's clearly labelled as being uh, augmented with, with other materials. Usually fruit juices are added, for example. Well, thank you very much for your questions. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lewis, uh, and welcome to country. And uh, thank you very much, Vlad. Can you uh, join me in your appreciation, your appreciation to...